To get started this evening, I would first like to acknowledge the presence of our former Governor General, former Member of Parliament, former Deputy Prime Minister, Sir Abel Tankras. Now I'd like to call um, Ms. Robin Thompson, a senior student, an econ major, a representative of the Economic Society, to bring a few words. Ms. Robin Thompson, for chance here. Good evening. In 2008, the Economic Society of the College of the Bahamas was formed under the leadership of Head of Department, Professor Randy Forbes. The purpose of this organization is to provide a forum to raise awareness and inform the student's body and the general community of relevant economic issues. The goals and objectives, therefore, are first, to provide a forum for students to learn about, discuss, and debate issues from, e from an economic perspective. Second, to encourage students to get involved with the economic process of the Bahamas. Third, to help open dialogue with students and business decision makers. Fourth, to provide a platform for students to voice their opinion and create creative solutions for domestic economic issues. And finally, to foster com comradeship among economic majors and the general student's body. Coming to the lecture now with brief remarks will be the Dean of the School of Business, Mrs. Moxie. Please join me in welcoming her. Good evening. So I will turn quest, former Governor General of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, Mrs. Joan Thompson. She's president of the Nassau Institute, but I understand she's not well this evening. Do keep her in your prayers. Mr. Riccolo, Vice President and Treasurer of the Institute, the Templeton Foundation, any members who are here from the Nassau Institute, Mr. Randy Forbes, Assistant Professor in the Banking, Economics, and Finance Department, and also Head of Department for that area, faculty, staff, students, and guests, good evening. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening to this first lecture in the Institute's 2015 Visiting Professor Series. This relationship was birthed some 11 years ago between the Nassau Institute and the College of the Bahamas, when some students, along with Mr. Randy Forbes, was invited by Mr. Rick Lowe, founding member of this organization, I believe he was at the time, to attend the monthly discussions as active participants. To Mr. Lowe, we say thank you on behalf of the administration, the faculty, staff, and students of this, organ of this lovely College of the Bahamas. We say thank you. We say thank you for engaging our students in such a manner and our faculty. This engagement has enabled our students to participate in discourses which undoubtedly have contributed to their growth and development. Having been exposed to various economic thoughts, speakers, and contentions of others that they might not have heard otherwise. For this, we are indeed grateful. We are particularly pleased that the Nassau Institute has seen fit to partner with the Templeton Foundation and the College of the Bahamas this year to bring the lectures to the College of the Bahamas, to this Harry Seymour Library, an edifice of which we are all indeed extremely proud. Over the years, we note that the Institute have had a lot of very engaging speakers who spoke on various relevant, timely, thought-provoking topics, and this year is no different. We invite the audience to go online to www.nasainstitute.org and sign up for the remaining sessions if you have not done so already. We also invite you to find a friend or a family member and bring them along. We challenge the members of this institute, however, to continue the good work which they have started. Continue to draw from the works of scholars. Continue to bring scholars to our shores to speak on topical relevant issues. 
continue to engage our students, our faculty, the wider community, and continue to be true to your mission, which is to formulate and promote public policies for the Bahamas based on principles of limited government, individual freedom, and the rule of law. I would like to say on behalf of the College of the Bahamas, on behalf of the administration of this great institution, the faculty, the staff, and the students, we wish you a very successful 2015 lecture series. Good evening. Dr. Thomas De Lorenzo is a professor of economics at Loyola University, Maryland, and senior fellow of the Ludwig von Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama. He has a PhD in economics from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University and has written numerous articles for academic journals such as the American Economic Review and the International Review of Law and Economics. He is also the author or co-author of 14 books and a regular columnist and blogger for lourockel.com and mises.org. He is widely published in newspapers like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and Washington Post. Please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Dr. DiLorenzo. Thank you. You did a great job. Thank you very much. Uh, and. Uh, Thanks to the uh, Nassau Institute for inviting me uh, to your uh, beautiful college here. Uh, I was just talking about in the, with someone uh, up front that in the U.S., every college in the U.S. wants to become a university just at a time when the big universities are all starting to collapse financially. And so it's kind of a conundrum. Everyone wants to be a university, and the big universities are in big, big trouble with all that brick and mortar to pay for. But uh, I guess that's my first warning to the College of the Bahamas. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, my university, uh, Loyola University of Maryland, was Loyola College until about five years ago. And, uh, and there was a big battle over that because the alumni did not want to change from college. Their degree said Loyola College, and, uh, but they changed. And, uh, but that was about it. That's, the name changed, and that was about it. And uh, so thanks to Rick Lowe for inviting me, and thanks to all the supporters of the, uh, the Institute. And I'll get right into it. Uh, you know, my topic, uh, I, one of the courses I teach at my university is American Economic History. And, uh, and so I look at history from the lens of economics. And uh, it's, you know, I'm a bit biased since I'm an economist by training, but I think you can learn a great deal uh, more than a historian can learn, just a historian, about history with a background in economics. You, you learn to ask different questions, and you're capable of answering those questions. And I don't mean you need to get a PhD in economics either. If you understand basic, uh, the basics, of uh, fundamentals of economics, it can go a long way toward enhancing your understanding of history. And history is just so interesting uh, uh, besides that. Uh, and so that's one of the things that uh, occupies my time in terms of research and writing is economic history. And uh, as far as lessons for the Bahamas, what I'm going to do tonight is, is tell a story. I'm going to tell a story about how America became a, a corporate welfare state. Uh, if you read about America these days, you, re uh, you read about the uh, controversy over the so-called one percenters. The people who are uh, the, one per the, the richest 1% in the country. Uh, well, it turns out that a lot of these people, I would even argue that probably most of the people who, uh, that uh, fall into that category <clears throat> made a lot of their money by some sort of governmental connection. And there's a lot of seething resentment over that. And, uh, and that's what I mean, sort of what I mean by the corporate welfare state, is that there, there really there are two ways to make money. One is to produce goods and services for your fellow man and fellow woman and, and, uh, and make them happy. And in return, they give you money. One of my favorite phrases from the famous book, The Wealth of Nations, written by Adam Smith, the, the, the Scottish economist Adam Smith, who's sort of, uh, you know, he's credited with being sort of the inventor of uh, economics. He wasn't the inventor, but he, 
a lot of people talk about him as though he was, but uh, I can paraphrase him as saying what, what markets mean, what capitalism mean, means really is uh, give me that which I want and I will give you that which you want. That's what, basically what capitalism is. That's one way to make money. Give people what they want. Another way to make money is through political connections. Uh, you, can, you can make money by selling better mousetraps. You know, you can have the best mousetrap in town and make some money there. Or you can lobby the legislature to ban the importation of all foreign mousetraps into your country. And if you do that, then the price of mousetraps goes up and you make more money that way. But from the consumer's perspective, all the consumer gets is they pay more for the same thing. But you, the mousetrap salesman, make a killing. And that's corporate welfare. And there, there of course, are uh, thousands and thousands of different examples that, that I could give about that. And I'm going to give a couple of specific examples based on American history in the story I'd like to tell about how America eventually became a corporate welfare state. And one of the lessons, I guess the main lesson of this, you know, the subtitle of my talk was Lessons for the Bahamas, is that economic ideas really do matter. Uh, you know, the late Milton Friedman, the famous economist Milton Friedman, uh, used to say that uh, ideas that take a hold in the public mind usually have about a 20-year gestation period. Once, once a big idea becomes popular with not every single person in the public, but a, a large segment of the public, then about 20 years later, that'll become public policy. It takes about 20 to 25 years. Friedrich Hayek said the same thing. And so part of the story I'm going to tell about American history is the, about the importance of ideas. And, and, and what, sort of a side lesson of that is that uh, we, can always, we can always change the status quo, but we have to change people's thinking first. We have, to we have to convince people first that it's a good idea to change the status quo. So even though in America there are a lot of unhappy people about the situation, the one percenters and, and uh, the corporate welfare state, as, as I call it, uh, well, that's not written in stone. That can change. Uh, even, the, even the Soviet Union collapsed eventually. And uh, during, during much of my earlier life, I never thought I would live to see the day for that. But that, you know, that was a, a very big change in the world 20-some years ago. And so, so I'll start with my, uh, my story about how America became a, a, a corporate welfare state. And it starts with the American Revolution. And you know, we, we got rid of the British Empire about 200 years before the Bahamians did. Uh, I guess your Independence Day is 1973. Ours, uh, 1776 was our, uh, the Independence Day in, in, in the US. And, and one of the things that the, the, the American colonists uh, rebelled against was the British system, the British economic system of mercantilism. And I mentioned Adam Smith a minute ago, a minute ago you know, this famous book, his famous book, The Wealth of Nations. It's actually called a, An Inquiry into the Causes and, uh, and, and the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, but everyone calls it The Wealth of Nations. And you can look, look it up on the web if you haven't been exposed to it. But that was written in 1776. It was published in 1776, the same year as the American Revolution. And uh, his famous book was a, a condemnation of this British system, economic system called mercantilism. And in a nutshell, what mercantilism is was a, a, a combination of policies that benefited producers or sellers at the expense of consumers, granting of monopolies to certain businesses. The, the blocking of imports from other countries with high tariffs, which is a tariff is just a sales tax on imports from another country, uh, and, and that sort of thing. And so, uh, and, and it benefited the, the sellers or the producers, not all of them though, but it benefited the politically connected producers at the expense of everybody else. So this big fat book by Adam Smith is, is a refutation of that. and. Uh, and so, and of course, part of the British Empire was uh, the American colonies at the time. And so uh, the British government was imposing mercantilism on the colonists and they didn't like it. In, uh, in, in the famous American Declaration of Independence, there's a section of it called the Train of Abuses. And, and, uh, and Thomas Jefferson, the, uh, the American who became the Amer third American president, wrote, uh, is the author of that. And among the train of abuses was he has cut off our trade with the rest of the world. 
And so there, there was something called the Navigation Acts that, that basically plundered American uh, merchants by forcing them to use British sailors and to, uh, if they were going to sell their tobacco and rice and cotton and other things in Europe, they had to first stop in England and pay a tribute or a tax to the British, and then they could go to France or wherever and try to sell their goods there. And, uh, and that's, they called that taxation without representation because they didn't have legitimate representation in the British Parliament at the time. And so to, a, to some extent, the American Revolution was a revolution against British mercantilism. And so when the, and then when the revolution ended, though, there were two major political factions in the United States. Uh, one faction was led by uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton, who uh, was the, the, became the first Treasury Secretary of the United States. As a young man, he was uh, uh, an assistant to the George Washington, who was the, the <laughs> commanding general of the army, of the Revolutionary Army. He, uh, he, he uh, was born on the island of Nevis, uh, and he, he grew up in... Uh, St. Croix, and he worked for some British uh, plantation owners in St. Croix who sent him to Columbia University, what is now Columbia University, a very brilliant man. And, uh, and he was the leader of uh, the, the nationalists in, in the American uh, historical scheme. They were known as, they called themselves the Federalist. And the other opposing viewpoint in, in American uh, political history was uh, led by Thomas Jefferson. It was Hamilton's nemesis. And, uh, and Jefferson, uh, I brought in uh, a little statement of his from his first inaugural address when he became president in the year 1801. And here, here's his view of government, of good government. This is from his first inaugural address as president. A wise and frug frugal government which shall restrain men from injuring one another shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. That is the sum of good government. So he was telling Americans, in his view, the purpose of government is basically to maintain a civilized society and law and order, and then uh, keep people from injuring each other. And that's pretty much it. It was no, it was no crusading around the planet uh, to, to, uh, to impose democracy or anything like that. It was pretty much maintain a stable society and, uh, and let people pursue their lives the best they can in whatever ways they can. Uh, Jefferson later founded the University of Virginia. So he, was a, he was a big advocate of education. And so you contrast that with, him, with uh, Alexander Hamilton, who was pretty much diametrically opposed to that idea. Uh, Hamilton was the instigator of the United States Constitution. We, we had a constitution, it was called the Articles of Confederation, but it did not give the central government taxing authority. All the taxes were lo state and local taxes. And so for, for several years, uh, Hamilton instigated uh, and lobbied f campaign to have a convention to write a new constitution, and he succeeded. We had a constitutional convention in Philadelphia and, uh, and Hamilton's plan was basically uh, to bring back a king in the form of a permanent president who would appoint all the governors uh, who could veto all state legislation. And so the Jeffersonians looked at this and said, well, we just fought a revolution against that kind of system. Uh, why would we want that? But it was all connected to economics. It was all connected to economics because they saw this as their only way of imposing the, uh, a, an American version of the British mercantilist system on America. So you had Hamilton and his supporters who had just literally, he, he was literally, he was a big a war hero in the American Revolution, but who wanted to impose on Americans the same system that he personally had fought against in a, in a, in a long, eight year long war. And when, when, I, when, I, when I first sort of got into this and, and understood what was going on here, it reminded me of this old mo uh, movie, the old movie, History of the World Part Two. I don't know if any of these students have ever seen History of the World Part Two, but uh, the comedian and actor Mel Brooks portrays the King of France. And he has a laugh line in the movie, the King of France. He keeps saying, it's good to be the king. You know, who would argue with that? It's, good, you know, it's not good to be the king? It's good to be the king. And that's basically was Hamilton's position, that if you're on the paying side of a mercantilist empire, that's not good. You're being plundered. But if you're on the money collecting side, that's good. It's 
It's good to be the king. And so they wanted to impose the king system, the king of England system on America, an American version. They even called it the American system. It was one of the very first slick, uh, you know, contradictory terms in politics. It was really the British system, but they were thinking, well, if we call it the American system, maybe people will fall for it if we call it the American system. But it was, it was through and through the British system. But it was pretty simple. They wanted uh, uh, subsid uh, tax funded subsidies to uh, politically connected corporations. Today we call it corporate welfare. Back in those days, they, called, they had a, a nice sounding name for it. It was called internal improvement subsidies. And, uh, they, and, but uh, we, in America anyway, we call it corporate welfare. They wanted a high protectionist tariffs that would protect American manufacturers from competition from other countries. They wanted a, a bank run by politicians. Now, there's a good idea, <laughs> isn't it? A bank run by politicians, a, a national bank, a national bank. And Hamilton also championed a large national debt for the sake of having a large national debt. He didn't say we need to borrow money to build roads and things like that. He was quite a, quite a Machiavellian, now, that is, a, a conniver and schemer. And, 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 but he wasn't secretive about it. He, he came right out and said that the, the reason why we should have a lot of debts, a lot of government debt, is that it's mostly the, the affluent and wealthy people of the country who will buy government bonds. That's who will own the debt. When you buy, you know, when the government borrows money, they sell bonds. Who's going to buy the bonds? Well, it's people with money. It's people with, uh, you know, big money will buy, will be the majority owners of the government bonds. And that will form a political interest group that will forever support higher taxes and bigger government because they want to make sure there's enough tax money in the treasury to pay off the principal and interest on their bonds. That was his reasoning. That's why he said we need a big government debt. So that's why I called it Machiavellian, you know, very, very conniving, very, very scheming. And that was, that was his system of, of big government debt. Uh, Jefferson, on the other hand, his view of debt was that it's immoral to issue, it's okay to issue for government to go in debt. We, you know, we need to public works and things. It's, you know, you borrow money for an 18 year project and you pay it off over 18 years and the road lasts 30 years. That, you know, we've been doing that forever, something like that. But he said it's immoral to have debt that lasts more than a generation. And in his day, that was 18 or 20 years because he thought it was immoral for one generation to impose taxes on a future generation it can't, cannot defend itself politically. It can't, you're plundering future generations by doing that. And the Jeffersonian view on public debt uh, more or less prevailed in America until World War I, until the turn of the 20th century. Uh, for example, one American president, Andrew Jackson, this was in the 1830s, he actually paid off the public debt. He had paid off the very last dime. He paid it off. There was zero public, national public debt uh, during that era because that was the philosophy that this is, uh, you know, it's not bad to borrow money. It's, it's not, you know, it's not a bad thing per se for government to borrow money, but uh, within reason, don't, don't plunder future generations. And so, so that's a good example of what I said earlier about how ideas matter, economic ideas matter. Jefferson and his followers, and it wasn't just Jefferson, it was many, many people who were writers and teachers and professors, journalists, who spread this, this information, this education around about, you know, what should we do about debt? Uh, you know, what kind of debt should we have? And that view prevailed for, for over a century in, in the United States. And, and, but war is what, what destroyed that idea. You know, the, the debt from, from the war was just uh, overwhelming in, in, in uh, all, all wars, uh, that always happens. So that was, that was the scheme. And I'll, um, in uh, my old uh, friend, the late Murray Rothbard, uh, he was, he was quite, uh, quite the astute uh, uh, economist. In one of his publications, he, he spotted, he spotted uh, what Hamilton and his cronies were up to long before I wrote my book. By the way, I, I have my book, Hamilton's Curse, in the back, I'm selling copies dirt cheap after the talk, if anybody's interested, along with one of my other books. But here's what Murray Rothbard, the economist, said uh, these people were up to in early America. They wanted, quote, to reimpose in the new United States 
a system of mercantilism and big government similar to that in Great Britain against which the colonists had rebelled. The object was to have a strong central government, particularly a strong president or king as chief executive, built up by high taxes and heavy public debt. The strong government was to impose high tariffs to subsidize domestic manufacturers, develop a big navy to open up and subsidize foreign markets for American exports, and launch a massive system of internal public works. In short, the United States was to have a British system without Great Britain. And so that's, that in a nutshell is, is what uh, the political battle, this is what the political battle in America was over, for, uh, was about for about 75 years, the, the succeeding 75 years uh, that the, uh, the economic ideas that were debated uh, were about this. And of course that debate continues to today for example, my book, it's called Hamilton's Curse, and uh, the, the subtitle is uh, How Jefferson's Arch Enemy Betrayed the American Revolution and What It Means for Today. When it came out, my publisher, Random House, uh, wrote a really top-notch press release and sent it to all the American media, and, it, and this was shortly after the crash of 2008, the economic <laughs> crash, and uh, the press release said, this explains the origins of the cra of today's crash because it's based on misbehavior by the Fed, the central bank, championed by Alexander Hamilton and, 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 and corporate welfare, uh, the bailouts that came after the crash. Those were all Hamiltonian ideas. And so uh, MSNBC was, uh, was, was so taken in by the press release that they sent a limousine to my house at 6 o'clock in the morning to take me into Washington, D.C., to their <laughs> studio and put me on television to talk about it. But then it, it turned out being, uh, they sat me down next to this um, journalist, uh, Patrick Buchanan. I don't know if anybody knows Patrick J. Buchanan. And he, I, I sit next to him and he says, Alexander Hamilton was my hero. <laughs> and, and, so, and, so, and so it was like five people shouting at me. And, uh, and, and, and so I, I hardly had a chance. To, I did sell some books though, because they put my book on the screen and they, they lied and said it, I'm a best-selling author and things like that. So, so I did sell, did sell some books anyway. So it was worth my getting up at 5 a.m. And, and going down to, to the studio uh, to do that. Uh, I did get the last word in. Uh, this is actually on YouTube. I did get the last word in. So I'm sitting there listening to five people shouting at me, you know, not, not, you know grossly unfair. They, they invite me to come down there and they wouldn't let me talk. And so I, the last thing I said was, well, at least Aaron Burr had a good reason for shooting someone unlike Dick Cheney. Now, not the you bah Bahamians might not all be in, in, know what I'm talking about, but Aaron Burr is a, was in a duel with Alexander Hamilton and shot him dead, a duel. And, uh, and Dick Cheney was out hunting with one of his friends and <laughs> shot him in the face. So I, so I said, at least Burr had a reason to shoot somebody. And, and then that was it. And then they went to a commercial and I walked off out of the studio. Uh, and, and Pat Buchanan, I don't know, he, he didn't laugh at that. I don't know. I, 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 thought, I thought it was funny at, at the time. So, so, so let me, I'm going to explain, I'm going to illustrate the, how, how ideas are important uh, in terms of this, this struggle over, you know, are we going to have a national bank? And uh, are we going to have protectionist tariffs in, in our country? Uh, are we going to have massive internal improvement subsidies for roads and bridges and canals and all, and all these things? And so uh, you know, I'm going to sort of briefly tell the story. But in terms of banking, Hamilton, uh, you know, he became the, uh, the Treasury Secretary. And that's an interesting story that uh, when, and, and, and there's a big fat biography of Alexander Hamilton uh, called Alexander Hamilton. And uh, the author is Ron Chernow. And, uh, and he, he explained how Hamilton got the job as America's first Treasury Secretary. And that uh, it was almost the end of the American Revolution. Hamilton is a young man, I think he was 22. He was George Washington's right-hand man. He was the adjutant general of the Revolutionary Army. And he's thinking, well, what am I going to do after the war is over? Uh, I work for the most powerful man, the commanding general of the army. I'll write a letter to the richest man in America, which he did, uh, uh, Robert Morris, who was known as the financier of the American Revolution. So he writes a letter to Morris, basically, saying, uh, and, and Morris was uh, uh, the real uh, power behind the throne, so to speak, of this agenda, this American, uh, American uh, um, uh, system agenda of high tariffs, uh, corporate welfare, and a national bank. He was a banker and a merchant, and all him and his business associates wanted to use government 
to, to help line their pockets. Uh, crony capitalism, you know, that's, that's what they wanted. They wanted mercantilism. They wanted a full-blown system of mercantilism. So Hamilton wrote him a, a very, uh, very uh, praiseworthy letter about wh how brilliant he thought his ideas were about a, a bank run by politicians and high protectionist tariffs and so forth. And so eventually, uh, Morris writes George Washington and recommends him, Hamilton, for the job as, uh, as uh, Treasury Secretary. And George Washington uh, turned to Hamilton and said, I didn't know you knew anything about finance. We never talked about it. And so, and he didn't. He didn't really know anything uh, about it, but, uh, but he knew he was a good politician. And he was, he was a brilliant, you know, he must have had an IQ of 190 or something like that. If you read uh, some of his writings and how clever he was and, and his accomplishments, you know, very high intelligence. That's why Jefferson feared him so much. Jefferson thought he was an enemy of freedom and he was a genius, you know, a genius IQ. And that, that can be a dangerous thing. You know, genius IQ per se is a, not always a good thing. There have been a lot of evil geniuses in the world. And I wouldn't say Hamilton's, you know, like some of the tyrants, you know, we know who are evil geniuses, but uh, you know, a political tyrant maybe. So the bank story, uh, one of the first things Hamilton did, uh, another Machiavellian, Machiavellian charade, was he nationalized all the debt. The war debt was, was, was issued by the state governments in the United States, the, the local governments. And so Hamilton, as Treasury Secretary, nationalized it. So the, and, and, he, and, and so all the insiders in the nation's capital knew that all these bonds, like a lot of these soldiers had been paid in government bonds. And so they were holding on to these bonds, which at the time were, sell, were trading for between two and 10% of par value. That means if, if, the, if the face value is $100, you can only get $2 or maybe 10, as much as $10 at the time. So all the insiders in, in, in the nation's capital, the Congress, and, and, and the White House, uh, and it wasn't there, even before there was a White House, it was you know, the presidency, uh, they knew that a law had been passed saying all of these bonds are gonna be purchased at full face value, 100%. So there was a mad scramble down the eastern seaboard of the United States by all the insiders to buy up all these bonds by, by the Revolutionary War veterans and, and anybody who had any of these bonds. Because uh, for the students in the room, this was before the internet. You know, this was this was long before the internet. So so you couldn't instantaneously know that this. You know, nowadays on Wall Street, if a piece of information that's relevant comes out, all the all the sharks on Wall Street know about it immediately. But uh, but this was this was you know, a different story. And so you know, if you read uh, biographies of this era, you read about stagecoaches, horses and buggies, uh, sailing ships going down the coast you know, in search of these bonds. And so many people made uh, millions of dollars, millions of dollars doing this. And uh, for example, um, Robert Morris, who's already probably the wealthiest man in America, made at least $18 million in this deal. This is back in the, in the 1780s, you know. $18 million. Governor George Clinton of New York made $5 million. Hamilton himself purchased some of the bonds, uh, quote, through buying agents in Philadelphia and New York, uh, according to one biographer. And so, so many people became in, tremendously wealthy through this. And so here's Thomas Jefferson, uh, the nemesis of, uh, of uh, Hamilton, watching all of this. You know, he was the Secretary of State in the Washington administration. Uh, Hamilton was Secretary of Treasury, and and he's watching all this, and you know, obviously disapproving uh, of, of what's going on, and so the, and so the, then Hamilton starts campaigning for a national bank, and the American Constitutional Convention had rejected that idea, but he was campaigning, crusading for a national bank, and uh, and he eventually they eventually convinced George Washington to go along with this. So we did adopt the national bank. It was called the First Bank of the United States, and. Jefferson figured out why this, this compulsion to have a national bank, because he said, well, we have banks. Uh, the proponents of it were saying, well, we need someplace to put tax revenues. And Jefferson said, well, we have banks, put the tax revenues in the bank. And we, we don't need our own bank. You know, we're not bankers, we're politicians and uh, you know, governors and things, we don't need, what do we know about banking? 
And so, uh, but anyway, they did. They started the, the first bank in the United States. But the reason for it, Jefferson was convinced, was corruption. Corruption. As he saw that all of these members of Congress who had become millionaires through the nationalization of the, the state government debt, well, that was a one-time thing. You know, there's only one time when you can become a millionaire by buying these state bonds at 10% of face value and selling them at 100%. That's over. So that generation of uh, members of Congress is going to retire or die off. And so Jefferson said a more permanent engine of corruption was needed. <laughs> yeah, so here's, here are his exact words. He said, some engine of influence more permanent must be contrived. He said, and this engine was the Bank of the United States. Because once you have that bank run by politicians, then you can finance the political careers of generations of politicians. And that's how we're going to get the American system. That's how we're going to get this pervasive system of corporate welfare. It's going to be financed through this permanent engine of, of corruption. And in, uh, in one of his letters, Jefferson tells a story of a, a meeting uh, you know, that he had with uh, Hamilton himself, the Secretary of State, uh, and the Attorney General of the United States. And, and this was back when uh, you know, the, the United States was so small, it would be like uh, you know, a, a town of 500, a few friends having dinner. You know, they, all, they all lived in a, around the same area in Virginia, uh, you know, most of them at this, except for Hamilton, and, uh, he, who was a New Yorker. And so, um, Anyway, he talks about this meeting they had, and uh, the topic was the British Constitution. And uh, John Adams, President John Adams, said that he said he thought the British Constitution was the, of the perfect constitution if it weren't for the corruption. And Hamilton intervened and said, oh no, that's what makes it the perfect constitution. <laughs> it's the added element of corruption. Because Hamilton wanted government to be far bigger than what the Constitution allowed for, and so you need corruption to do that. You need, you, need, you need the politicians who will ignore the Constitution and do what he wants them to do. And so you need to buy them off. And, and the bank is how we're going to buy them off. That was the plan. That was, that was the plan uh, in Jefferson's eyes. And I think Jefferson was absolutely right. And that is how it has turned out. I mean, when you, when you look at what happened in the U.S. after the crash of 2008, when the first thing the government does was come out and, and scare the daylights out of ordinary people by, by saying it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the Great Depression all over again, unless we give Morgan Stanley $300 billion or, you know, or you know, whatever investment banker buddies, Goldman Sachs, unless we give Goldman Sachs $50 billion, uh, you know, the, the world is going to come to an end and we're all going to burn in hell. You know, you know, that's, that's pretty much what President George W. Bush uh, was told to say. I won't say he said it because I'm... I don't think he was smart enough to think of that, but, but that's what that's what that's what he, that's what we, that's what Americans were told at the time. And how much more corrupt can you get? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, I always uh, I'm always amazed at how when they announce a new Treasury Secretary in the United States, it's it's always the former CEO of Goldman Sachs. I can't remember in my lifetime when the Treasury Secretary was not the former head of Goldman Sachs who finances the political careers of all the guys and gals in Washington. That's, that's, that's pretty much the game. And that was, that was created, by the way, when, when, by the government debt machine. When, the, when the, government was, the government was doing fine, when it was selling bonds and using it for infrastructure and, and the things government is supposed to be doing. But then when they started getting into debt, and these big, big trillions of dollars of debt for just everything, uh, well, they started uh, uh, doing business with all these investment bankers, and, uh, and, and mostly in New York City. And so the investment bankers had became had the Hamiltonian special interest. They developed a special interest in in government borrowing because they made they made money on every bond that was sold. They're the ones who sold the bonds for the government. And so Goldman Sachs and companies like that, they really are government. They're not really private. They're, they're part of the government in my eyes, as far as that goes. And so that's why the, uh, the American Treasury Secretary is almost always, for decades, uh, the, the former head of Goldman Sachs. He's just, he's just switching government jobs, basically. <laughs> he's, he's, not, he's not really leaving the private sector and sacrificing. Uh, in fact, the... the, uh, the uh, the Treasury Secretary 
under Bush, the, the last Bush Jr. Uh, he left. You know, he was he he went he got went there. He came from Goldman Sachs. He got I think it was a twenty some billion dollar subsidy for Goldman Sachs. He left, and then one day I pick up the New York Times, and I read that his wife went out shopping and bought herself a five million dollar house. And, and so it just doesn't get more corrupt than that. Maybe it does in the Bahamas. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I have no knowledge of what goes on here. You know, I don't read the papers here. But uh, maybe you do the same thing here. I don't know. But uh, but but that was, but but that's that, but that's exactly the kind of thing that old Thomas Jefferson, two hundred and some years ago, was was predicting that that this is why these people want a national bank run by politicians, an engine of corruption, and so and, and so they got it. But but the idea took a long time to take hold because. The first bank in the United States was so corrupt and it created 72% price inflation in its first five years, 72% price inflation, that the United States Congress did not renew its 20-year charter. So it lost its 20-year charter. And then we had the War of 1812 when the Americans tried to conquer Canada and that didn't work out too well. Uh, the British burned down the White House, which, uh, hold your applause please, but, uh, that's, uh, but in, the, in, in, in the Library of Congress. And, uh, and so the bank was resurrected to, uh, to help pay off the war debt. And so it had another 20-year charter. And at the end of the 20-year charter, there was another major political battle, and it was defunded by President Andrew Jackson in the, in the late 1830s. And so, uh, and because these ideas about, uh, you know, the, the proper role of government uh, did not, uh, you know, still prevail. That, that this is not a good idea to have a, a, a national bank run by politicians. You know, let them do their thing. Let the bankers do do, do something different. But uh, the the, uh, the combination of banking and state was thought to be a, a very dangerous idea, and and Andrew Jackson uh, defunded it. But he had a lot of help from people in all around the United States. The state of Ohio, for example, this bank of the United States opened up two branches in Ohio, the state of Ohio. And the people there knew a lot about it because it wasn't just the politicians like the Jeffersonians, Jefferson was dead by this time, but the journalists and other people who were, who were his, his followers, the followers of his ideas, had educated the public about the dangers of this, this, uh, this, this bank because they were doing such things as, as financing the careers of favored politicians at the expense of other politicians. So and that's inherently corrupt. It's like having a, a government bank using tax dollars to finance one side of, a, of an election. I mean, that's, that's, that's destroying democracy there when, when you use a bank for that purpose. And that's what this bank was, was doing. And so the people of Ohio uh, didn't want these branches in their, in their state. And so uh, the, govern, the governor of Ohio sent, uh, uh, imposed a, a $100,000 a year tax on these banks, these branches, banks. This is in the 1830s. And they sent armed marshals in to collect, which they did. So they literally walked into the bank vaults and took $100,000 out. They brought a big chest with them to fill up with money and dragged it out of there. And other states did the same thing. The state of Maryland did the same thing. And, and that's where there was a famous uh, American Supreme Court case called McCulloch versus Maryland uh, about this. And, uh, and one, of the, one of the slogans that came out of the, uh, the, uh, the decision by the Supreme Court uh, that, that held that the bank was, was constitutional was that the power to tax is the power to destroy. And what the, 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 the Chief Justice of the United States at the time was a man named John Marshall, and he meant the power to tax this bank run by politicians is the power to destroy a bank run by politicians. And the people of Ohio were saying, well, yeah, that's the idea. That's, that's, that's what we want to do, and so. Uh, but uh, but they the, but the Supreme Court uh, issued this uh, opinion that the bank was constitutional. But at that time in the United States, uh, the presidents uh, would look at these opinions by the United States Supreme Court and say, "Thanks, but my opinion is different." And that's what Andrew Jackson did. And he said, uh, "Thanks, but my opinion is different." The people of different the Ohio said. Thanks for your opinion, Mr. Marshall, but uh, our opinion is certainly different. And so uh, we didn't get this idea in the United States that the Supreme Court is, uh, you know, five government lawyers uh, are, have the ultimate say on what our liberty should be, what our, what our freedoms should be. 
That didn't come until after the American Civil War in the 1870s, 1860s, 1870s. But during this period of history, the Supreme Court was just one of three branches. You have your opinion, Congress has its opinion on the Constitution, the President has his, and the people of the states, they all have their opinions on it. And so, so, the, so the bank was not resurrected, uh, even though Marshall tried to come to the rescue and declare it being constitutional, that doesn't mean it's a good idea. You know, it, it might be constitutional in his opinion. but and, and so we didn't have a national bank for about 20 years. And, uh, and it, but it was eventually, the, national, the money supply was eventually nationalized during uh, the American Civil War, 1861 to 1865. Uh, we had uh, national currency acts, which created the greenback dollar. And, and, uh, and, and also there were competing currencies back then. Um, are you familiar with the, the phrase Dixie? You know, the song Dixie, uh, it refers to the southern states in the U.S., Dixie, the whole region is called Dixie. Well, D-I-X is 10 in French, and uh, the Dix was a $10 note published by a bank in New Orleans. And it was a very solid bank, and they had a very high percentage of gold reserves behind their money, behind their paper money, the Dix. And so it was so popular that the Dix was even used as a currency in Minnesota, the state of Minnesota. It was used all over the place. And there were competing monies back then. And so if you opened up a bank and, and, and people gave you their gold and their silver and you give them pieces of paper in return, but you didn't keep enough gold and silver in reserve in case they come and they want their gold and silver back, you would go bankrupt and they, and they, would, go, they would lose their money too. Who would use that currency? No, no, no. So that, that currency would not fly. People would pretty quickly understand that this is worthless paper. But the Dix was very prudent. They were a very, very well-run bank. And, so, uh, and so, so, so that's the system we had. But, but uh, in the 1860s, the U.S. government, the federal government, imposed a tax on all the, uh, the state-issued currencies like this. Uh, and, and because after all, the power to tax is the power to destroy. You know, their, their compatriot, John Marshall, told them that. He was a nationalist like Lincoln and, and the Henry Clay and Hamilton. They were all in the, all the nationalist crowd in American politics. And so, so they did a pretty good job of destroying the competing currencies. And the, and the government did uh, nationalize the money supply. But we didn't get the Fed until 1913. And so, so these ideas of why this, you know, we should be wary of having a bank run by politicians held off having a bank run by politicians for most of American history until 1913, until we got uh, the Fed. And, uh, and so another uh, a story, a brief story that I'll tell having to do with this, uh, how ideas matter and how they have uh, turned America into a somewhat of a corporate welfare state is the tariff story. And uh, at the beginning of the American Republic, uh, there, were no, there was no income tax. The, the first income tax was during the American Civil War, but that was temporary. They got rid of it after the war. And then, but the, the real income tax that we have now didn't come in until 1913. And so before that, most of the government was funded by uh, tariffs on imports. It's a sales tax on things that come from other countries uh, you know, at the ports. For example, at the time of the American Civil War, about 90% of all federal, federal tax revenue came up from tariffs. So the government was almost totally funded by tariffs and a few sales taxes on the, in, the, in land sales. There was, the government owned a lot of land. They would sell land and they would raise money that way. Okay. And so the, the, the original tariff was called a revenue tariff because we have this constitution that says these are the legitimate functions of the central government. And so how much money do we need? Well, it was thought that we could raise enough money through the tariffs on imports to fund the legitimate constitutional functions of government. That's why it was called a revenue tariff. But there was always uh, political pressure for a protectionist tariff. And the revenue tariff was maybe 10 or 12 percent tax on imports. But then a, uh, there was always political pressure by manufacturers for a protectionist tariff, make the tariff maybe 40 percent or 50 percent that would be not just enough to raise revenue, but it would keep competition out from overseas. Okay, so if someone from the Bahamas uh, 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 got on the, the television show Shark Tank and had a great new product and they wanted to sell it in, in the U.S., t take it to Miami, you would have, may have like a 50% tax slapped on you, whereas the person in Miami selling a similar product would have no tax. 
And so that, that's how they would keep the competition out with the tariff tax. Okay, and so there was, uh, again, there was this ongoing battle back and forth over that element of Hamilton's uh, American system, which was really the British system. And the, the first uh, bit of success that uh, the Hamiltonians had was in the year 1828, when they passed, the, the tariff had been 12 to 15 percent on average. They succeeded in raising the tar average tariff rate to 48 percent. 48% on imports in 1828. And, uh, and somebody in South Carolina started calling it the tariff of abominations. And it's, uh, it's one of my favorite phrases in economic history, the tariff of abominations. Uh, kind of reminds me of the abominable snowman. I don't know why, I, I, I like that, abomina. Uh, I just like that word abomination. It's a, it has a good rhythm to it. But, uh, but, the, but the people in the southern states uh, uh, objected to this also in the, the American Midwest but, and, and because it was mostly farmers, farmers who, who, uh, who uh, uh, opposed this because what happened was the American farmers at that time and, 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 and other times, especially at that time, they sold a lot of what they, a lot of their crop in Europe. For example, at the, in, in 1860, right before the American Civil War started, uh, about 75% of all the rice, cotton, tobacco that came from the U.S. was sold in Europe, okay? And so, so what happens is if you put a, and so if you put a, like a 50% tariff on goods coming from Europe, farm tools, shoes, woolen blankets, clothing, things coming from different countries in Europe, the people in Europe who sell all these things have much less money in their pockets because they're, they're, they're not selling to this big market in America. It was even by, by those standards of that time, it was still a big market. And so what were they doing with all these dollars, the American dollars that they were earning by selling their shoes and blankets and clothing and everything to Americans? They were buying mostly farm goods, food, uh, food goods, you know, all of rice, cotton, tobacco, things like that. So, so when you impose a tax on, on, um, on imports into America, you dry up the business of people who sell overseas. So that, there's an old saying in economics that a tax on imports becomes a tax on exports. If you tax imports, you harm your trading partners. And the trading partners therefore have less money that they can buy stuff from you with. And so who was being harmed? It was mostly farmers and mostly southern farmers who were selling cotton, tobacco, rice, and other things in Europe in giant quantities. And so they, they objected to this. And, uh, and uh, the, the state uh, people in the state of South Carolina led the protest against this. And, uh, and so they just simply declared, we are not going to collect this tax. At, uh, they were supposed to collect it at Charleston Harbor. This is the year 1828. He said, they, so they said, we're not going to collect this tax. They even, the South Carolina legislature even voted to give the governor $160,000 with which to buy firearms in case tax, federal tax collectors showed up. So $160,000 worth of guns in, in the year 1828. You could buy a lot of ammo in uh, 1828. You know, I filled an army. And, uh, and so they were serious about uh, leaving the Union, seceding, uh, and, and because they thought that they thought this was a breach of the Constitution, that this was just a bald-faced plunder. There's no other reason for this law but plundering farmers. And they said they, they got the votes to plunder us, and they're going to use them. And so they were willing. And so there was a big battle. Uh, Andrew Jackson, who I mentioned earlier, was the president. And so uh, you know, he he huffed and puffed and threatened to collect the tax, but in the end they compromised, and so they they compromised, and the tax went down over the next ten years. So by the time you get to the 1850s, uh, the average tariff rate in America was down to about 15 percent, one five, 15 percent again, revenue tariff, enough to to finance the constitutional functions of government. Then the Republican Party was created around that time, just a few years earlier. And they were, they were the Hamiltonians. That was the new reincarnation of the Hamiltonians. They, they were first the Federalists, then they became the Whigs. And then the same interest group uh, was, was represented by the Republicans. 
And one of the very first things the Republicans did as soon as they got votes was they, they, they passed a tariff bill called a Morrill Tariff, spelled M-O-R-R-I-L-L. -L. It was named after a congressman from Vermont named Justin Morrill, who was a steel manufacturer by profession. And it, it increased uh, the average tariff rate to, from 15 to 32 percent. And this is before the American Civil War. This is before Lincoln was president. This was about a year. This is 1859. And so, uh, so it was before all that uh, stuff took place. And so, uh, and so when and Lincoln was a Hamiltonian on economic policy. So when he came in, the, uh, uh, the Lincoln administration raised tariffs 10 times so that after the Civil War was over, the American Civil War, it was over in 1865, the average tariff rate was about, was about 45%. And it remained there until the year 1913, until the income, around there, 45, 50, 40, you know, it would fluctuate depending on what Congress would do. But it was between 40 and 50 percent for that whole period from 1862 until the year 1913. So we had a, a protection, protectionist tariff policy. And, uh, and so, the, so that idea eventually did win out, but uh, it took a long time. But then... Uh, it was lowered again uh, because the American farmers, especially Midwestern farmers, they were just being killed by this. Their, 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 their business in Europe was dried up by it. And part of the deal for getting a, an income tax in the United States was uh, the government, the proponents of the income tax in the government told the farmers of the country, we will, we will end this unfair, disproportionate taxation of farmers through the tariff, through high tariffs. Uh, if you farmers support an, politically support an income tax. That was the deal. So they did. They dropped the income tax rate down to something like 18, 20 percent, uh, you know, from 45 or 50 percent. And in return, we got the income tax. And then uh, that was uh, 1913. But then by, by 1930, the tariff rate was back up to 60 percent. So the farmers were snookered and lied to. It was a big bait and switch game that was that was played, and so, and so uh, you know, the, I mentioned Milton Friedman earlier. One one of the things that pops into my head that Friedman once said was that about this whole tariff issue was that if the economics profession, in a whole, is responsible for tariffs being 10 percent lower than they otherwise would be, then they would have earned many thousands of times more than whatever their lifetime incomes is. Because from all the billions of dollars, they would have saved the whole population from freer trade and all, and all that. So, so ideas are important here. Uh, that, you know, one of the things that did, you know, that 60% that tariff rate, that was, that was the, called the Smoot-Hawley tariff in the United States, named after two members of Congress. But it, it created an international trade war that, uh, that reduced the volume of world trade by two thirds in three years, the Smoot-Hawley tariff. And so that was not good. That was, you know, and that was right at the outset of the Great Depression. So that didn't help the Great Depression, you know, in terms of getting out of the Great Depression. That, that was very, very harmful. And so one of the, one of the uh, good things that Franklin Roosevelt did was he got the ball started uh, with an international, <clears throat> international uh, program of uh, getting together with all these countries and getting rid of these ta high tariffs. And it eventually became known as the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, G-A-T-T. People used to call it the General Agreement to Talk and Talk because all these like 80 countries would get together for weeks at a time and, and argue over what the tariff on sugar should be and things like that. But they did it, you know, after 20, 30 years, you know, meeting after meeting after meeting, the, they, they whittled down those, those tariff rates and, and we had much freer trade so that in the United States today, the average tariff rate is, is like 2% you know, on average. You know, there's almost, almost no tariffs. Every once in a while, that you, there's a, a big tariff on something to pay off some special interest group. But, but on average, there's, they've pretty much uh, gotten rid of that. Okay, so that's, that's, that was the second element. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish up here with... Uh, making just one comment on the, the corporate welfare aspect of the of early America. The, the debate for a long time was over, uh, should the, does the government need to use tax dollars for uh, roads, canals, uh, and uh, 
you know, roads and canals. That was basically it. This is before trains and things like that. And uh, they invoke the free rider problem that, uh, you know, voluntary contributions or investors will not be sufficient to, uh, to finance roads and canals. So we need to use tax dollars uh, to do this. But, uh, and that was Hamilton's idea also. Hamilton wrote a big, long report advocating this. But then uh, there's an economist named Daniel Klein who wrote a scholarly paper in a journal, academic journal called Economic Inquiry. And he did a study of uh, road building in early America. And he found out some very interesting things. He found out this, that the private road building movement built new roads at rates previously unheard of. Over $11 million was invested in, these roads are called turnpikes in New York, six and a half million dollars in New England. This is around the year 1800. So six million dollars is a, that'll jingle in your pocket a little bit in the year 1800. <laughs> you can buy some stuff with that. And uh, between 1794 and 1840, 238 private New England turnpike companies built and operated 3,750 miles of road. New York led all of their states in mileage with over 4,000 miles as of 1821. So uh, private investors had been investing in roads. They've been building private roads uh, everywhere in the United States uh, for decades. And, uh, and, and communities were not so foolish as to just sit back and say, gee, wouldn't it be nice, I'm a, I'm a farmer. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a road where I could, I could go and drive my goods to the next town over and sell to those people too. They weren't so stupid as to think, well, gee, maybe we can do something about this. And so they did. The, the people in the communities invested in these turnpike companies because they knew it was in their economic self-interest uh, to do so. And if, those, and if there were free riders, there was social ostracism. People, their, their neighbors, their business associates would, uh, would pressure them. They wouldn't do business with them. They wouldn't, they wouldn't socialize with them or associate with them because they were free riders. They were, they were you know, not doing their part. And so they bought stock in these companies, even though they were only making a three or 4% return in the stock per se, and they could have been making 10% somewhere else, they knew there was another kind of return. Their whole town would prosper. And so they bought the stock anyway. And so that's a part of American history. They did do that. And so, so even though the free rider problem is something that exists with, with things like this that are sometimes called public goods, it doesn't mean you need government to take care of it all, at all times. And so, so there, this was another part of this big argument, this big political argument. And, uh, and uh, uh, among the presidents, the American presidents, who vetoed legislation to provide a single dollar in government money for roads and canals was Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, John Tyler, Andrew Jackson. They all opposed these things. Uh, James Madison, uh, he, he, is, he is known as the father of the American Constitution. He was a president at one point also. And uh, in Madison, he was the president after Jefferson. And uh, in his very last day in office as president of the United States, he vetoed a piece of legislation that, uh, that had as a part of it, it didn't have anything to do per se, the legislation with road building, but the members of Congress snuck in there a couple million dollars for road building. And James Madison used it as an opportunity to make a big speech. He says, I'm gonna educate Americans about their constitution. And he said, I can, I can put my finger on no part of the Constitution that allows the government to give money to a private corporation for anything. Yeah. Road building, apple tree growing, you know, you know, beekeeping, whatever, you know, nothing. And so the father of the Constitution, as he is known as, uh, that was his very last thing he did, his very last day in office as, uh, as president of the United States. So we didn't really get... Uh, uh, government funding of corporations until the, the Civil War when they started funding railroads. They started putting big money behind railroads. And, uh, and so and once they started doing that, uh, just about every other kind of corporation went to Washington and said, uh, well, where's mine? Uh, you know, if, if, if you can give money to the railroads, why not you know, me? What's, what's wrong with me? And uh, I don't know if this is true or not. I don't know where the word lobbyist came from, I'm not a linguist, uh, linguistic scholar, but one history book I read said that uh, President Ulysses S. Grant coined the phrase, or maybe he just liked it. I don't know if he coined it or if he just liked it. But uh, when he was president in the, in the 1870s, uh, he commented that there was a hotel in Washington, D.C. called the Willard Hotel, still there, the grand old Willard Hotel. 
And all these people who were in Washington to beg for tax dollars for their business would hang out in the Willard lobby until it was their, their meeting with Senator whoever or the president or whatever. And uh, Grant called them lobbyists because they hung out in the lobby of the Willard Hotel. That's the story of where the, where the word lobbyist came from. And so there were, there were these constitutional scruples against uh, corporate welfare, and there still are. There still is a movement in America. There are many groups like the Nassau Institute that, that, that tries to educate people about this. And, and it, it really has always taken a critical, only a critical mass. It, it doesn't take the whole population or even a majority. There, there's always the vital few. Uh, biblical scholars call it the remnant. Who, who can succeed even though they're, uh, they're small in numbers in, in educating people. And so, uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I do what I do and what the Nassau Institute does, what it, what it does, is to try to educate the remnant in some of these ideas. And so I guess, uh, the, the, as I said earlier, the main lesson for the Bahamas of all this American history is that it's never over until it's over, to quote uh, Yogi Berra. Wasn't that Yogi Berra who said that, that, uh, that economic ideas do matter and, uh, and, and the world can change and be changed uh, if enough people have these good ideas uh, in their heads. And, uh, and that's all I'm gonna have to say for now. And uh, I guess we'll have time for Q&A if anybody's interested. <laughs> yes, sir. Which um, system would you say, looking in retrospect, um, has developed better, the American system or the British system in today's understanding? Uh, he, he's asked me uh, which system has worked better, the British system or the American system. Uh, well, uh, the British got a head start in the in the welfare state before the before the Americans. We didn't really uh, uh, start funding a big welfare state until the late 1960s in the United States. We had welfare programs that we didn't really put big money behind them, but the Labor Party in Britain started putting big money on them much earlier. And also the, the Labor Party in Britain uh, nationalized uh, a lot of industries after World War II, and we didn't nationalize uh, anything. We, we denationalized uh, a lot of, that had been taken over by the U.S. government during World War II. And so uh, that, that's why uh, the, by the time you get to the 1970s, everyone was talking about the British disease which was the, the, the so-called disease of uh, sort of lethargic, inefficient uh, government enterprises and steel and the, the coal mines and, and, and things like that. And there were also, uh, you know, the public employee unions were much more powerful in Britain than they were in the U.S. That's why in the U.S., in, in quite a few states in the U.S., it's actually illegal for public employees to go on strike. Not, all, not everywhere, but some. And the, the reasoning for that is that uh, if you allow the, the police and the teachers and the ambulance drivers uh, and the garbage collectors to go on strike, well, the city council and the mayor, they're gonna cave. They're not, the people are not gonna put up with no police and no garbage collection very long. And so that essentially transfers the power to tax from the voters to the police union or the teachers union. And so the thinking is this is inherently an attack on democracy if you do that. And so that's, that's the reason it was given for why some American states have laws against it. That's why uh, uh, President Reagan uh, fired the air traffic controllers. When he came in, the people, there were government employees who worked the air traffic control at the airports. And, uh, and, uh, and they went on strike, but it was an illegal strike because there's a federal law that made it illegal. But that's why, that's why it was made illegal because they, they had the power to shut down the, the whole air traffic system and, and uh, extort money from the government, basically. And so, uh, and so and, but that was done in, in England in, in a you know, much greater degree than, than the United States and created the British disease. And so that's why they, they privatized some of the industries when Thatcher came in and, and, took, and reversed that. And so, you know, if you look at it from that period of history, the, the, the American system was, was better until then, but then uh, we seem to be trying to catch up to the old Soviet Union now in the United States, the, the, the way we're going, <laughs> we're going now. And so, uh, and so, uh, and I haven't really kept up with England, but they, they seem to be doing all the same dumb things that we do all, uh, all along. 
and uh, you know we're we're bankrupting ourselves with our military empire. You know we have the military bases in what is it 400 places you know all over the globe now, and if you watch American television, it's like CNN. It's just you know um, more. We need more war. We need more war. Even uh, and uh, and so. Uh, that's why a lot of other places, there, there are a lot of Americans now going, trying to find some place to escape to, getting another passport. Uh, my wife has been badgering me uh, for a year, couple years now to get an Italian passport because my grandfather came from Italy. And uh, it's just not that she would love to live in Italy necessarily, but if we need to leave town someday, we need a, a place to go. To go. But uh, there are many thousands of Americans who are so uh, disappointed uh, that that's, that's what they're doing. Uh, about that. Okay, let's see. Anybody else have a question, comment? Uh, over here, yes, ma'am. Um, I do know that the um, American Law of Independence started with the, the Boston Tea Party. I, I just wondered, as it were, were the other taxes, what they opposed other taxes, or was just tea? Yeah, she's acting. She's asking about the the American Revolution was. Uh, you know, uh, was, there's a protest over uh, the Boston Tea Party was about a tax on tea. Yeah, just yeah what? Like yeah, there were other taxes. There, there was a, something called a stamp tax uh, that any kind of document, marriage license, or, uh, of anything, you had to pay a tax to uh, to the king, and then uh, and any kind of document. And then, but what what really irritated the colonists, I think, is that uh, the king sent soldiers into people's homes. To, to go through and you find, aha, the marriage license, aha, there's the, uh, this document, there's this document. So it's soldiers with guns coming into your house. And that's why this is made illegal in the U.S. Constitution. You can't, you can't quarter soldiers in, in, your, in your home unless, unless you happen to live in Boston after the Boston Marathon shooting. I guess that's okay <laughs> there. But, uh, but, but there was that, and there was something called the Navigation Acts that, that uh, impaired uh, uh, trade that was sort of a, a kind of a tax on people who sold goods in Europe. And so there, there were all these other taxes, but the, the total amount of taxes wasn't that much by today's standards. It was like three and a half or 4%. And I guess it's all relative, but, but it was the enforcement. Uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson wrote in the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence that uh, the, King of, uh, the King of England had sent, sent swarms, he used the word swarms, of people to invade our houses, and he was King George, King George III. He was he was referring to the soldiers who would had uh, would go into people's homes, searching around, you know, enforcing the stamp tax, and so so that was a very foolish thing for the king to do. He went too far there with the, the soldiers with bayonets in your house, looking for your marriage license or your death certificate from grandma or something. Yes, sir. I didn't catch the first part of your talk. I was a bit late, so I got there. But um, you know, a few months ago last year, we had a, a lecture here from the uh, IDB, and he spoke about cronyism, capitalism, or cronyism, nepotism, and corruption uh, being the uh, most important cause of slow economic growth in the Caribbean. And you compare Caribbean countries with other countries of similar size. And those three factors were the biggest cause of slow growth in the Caribbean. And as a matter of interest, the Bahamas is the slowest of the lot. Mm. His, his comment is uh, the uh, speaker from the International Development Bank said that uh, cronyism and corruption, the things I've been talking about, are sort of a, a, a special plague in the Caribbean, in the, and especially Bahamas. Uh, well, well uh, you know, I haven't studied the, the Caribbean political economic systems that much. Um, and I used to spend a lot of time in St. John as one of my favorite places in the world uh, to, to go. And, uh, but uh, there was a, there's a whole big literature in economics. And one, one name that's associated with it is there, there was a, a professor at the University of Maryland years ago called Mansur Olson. M-A-N-C-U-R was his first name. I think it was Swedish, Olson. And uh, he's, he's passed away since. But, but he wrote several books uh, on this phenomenon that uh, economists call rent-seeking. And I call it plunder-seeking. And uh, you can explain it very simply. It's, uh, in fact, I, I alluded to it at the beginning of my talk, that there, there are two ways to make money. Produce goods and services and sell them to other people. You know, benefit your fellow man in some way, and, and he or she will benefit you by giving you money. Or you can use political connections 
to keep the competition out, get yourself a monopoly, something like that. And what this plunder seeking is, is all the time, effort and money spent making these political connections. Because if you get people uh, whose, whose whole being is, is spent trying to influence politics to get themselves some special advantage, a monopoly privilege, keep the competitors out or something like that, then the alternative use of their time is what economists call opportunity cost is productivity. They could be producing goods and services because that's the only other way to make a living. So the more people you have getting involved in trying to make money through political connections, by definition, the fewer people you have and the fewer time is spent producing goods and services to make money that way, entrepreneurship. And so uh, and the Mansur Olson, in one of his last books was, uh, uh, he even argued that one of the reasons for Japanese economic success after World War II, we nuked the Japanese, the Americans dropped nuclear bombs on Japan and look at them today. I mean, uh, you know, or look at them 25 years ago, was that this whole infrastructure, this rotten sort of fascist infrastructure, which was just another type of crony capitalism was wiped away. You know, all, the, all these connections of the government. And they had a, a much more, much freer market so that Mitsubishi and Nissan and Toyota and all these companies could do pretty much, they didn't, didn't even have antitrust laws all those years after the war. So they could do whatever they want to make cars or whatever, and they did, they thrived. And so, uh, so that, there's a, actually a big literature on that in economics uh, and on development economics too. It's, it's, and the, I'm sure this, the speaker is probably familiar with that and not just the situation in, uh, in Bahamas and uh, in the Caribbean uh, and, and other places. But, uh, but it's true, it's, it's something that people who study these things have recognized for hundreds of years and uh, the reason why it persists is that uh, you know, the way government works is uh, concentrated benefits and dispersed costs. Uh, the, the people who benefit are usually uh, these programs are a relatively small group and they're very influential. They know who to thank for the benefit. And it might cost all of us $50 a year, $100 a year. And we don't even know why it, it costs an extra $50 or $100 a year. You know, I, I, I wrote one of my, you know, I write on a couple of websites and one of my articles is called Farmed Robbery. You know, you know like armed robbery, farmed robbery. It was about, the, there was an article on the front page of the USA Today newspaper about a man in Texas who grows cotton. And his picture was there, he had a big smile on his face, grin to grin, you know, his smile was like up to here somewhere. And so it caught my eye, what's this man smiling about? And he's holding something in his hand. And in his hand, he was holding a check from the U.S. government for $400,000. Because they, they have a program in the U.S. that says if the price of cotton goes below um, a certain amount, what it, it can never go below, I think it was 58 cents in that year. Okay, if it goes below 58 cents a pound, the U.S. government will give cotton farmers the, distant, the difference between the actual price and 58 cents. So in that year, had been a big year for cotton growing and the price had gone down to 37 cents. So for every pound of cotton, he got 21 cents from the government and he had millions of pounds, you know, a gigantic industrial cotton farm. There's, there's a big aquifer, which is a giant underground lake in Texas. And even though Texas is a pretty dry place, in that one part of West Texas, there's this gigantic underground lake and they use the water to grow cotton. And so, and so this one guy, Got a check for four hundred thousand dollars for to make this. So I, I called it farmed robbery. So if you can make money that way, um, you know there was a, Walter Williams spoke here. I think Rick told me years ago. Walter Williams, the, the nationally syndicated columnist, economist, old friend of mine. He wrote the co he wrote the forward to one of my books. Uh, there was a new farm bill in America uh, with loaded down with programs like this, <clears throat> and he wrote. Uh, he wrote an open letter to the IRS because he had read this story in the newspaper that uh, the newspaper man, the newspaper man named Sam Donaldson, he was a, like the anchor for the ABC Evening News or something like that. He owned a sheep farm in New Mexico and he was paid $200,000 for not raising sheep. For not raising sheep. He didn't get, he didn't get money per sheep. He, and the, the, the economics of this is that the government says, well, how can we make farmers make more money? 
if we pay them to have fewer sheep, the price of mutton will go up and they'll sell lamb shank and everything at a higher price. So that's a way of getting farmers more money. And then the farmers in turn will send us, the Democrats and Republicans, millions of dollars to help finance our reelection campaigns. That's how it works. And so anyway, my friend Walter Williams wrote this open letter in one of his syndicated columns to the IRS. He said, dear IRS, like Sam Donaldson, I too do not raise sheep. Where's my $200,000? <laughs> Why don't I qualify? You know, and, and <clears throat> so it's a good thing to ridicule some of these people sometimes, because I, I find that there's nothing they hate worse than uh, the ridicule. Uh, my friend Gary North says, uh, you, maybe you can't fight City Hall, but you can pee on the front steps and run away. <laughs> that's that. And, 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 Yes, sir. That sounds all too familiar with modern <laughs> agricultural policy in Europe, yeah. I must say. Oh, yes, I that's... Say. But can, the question I wanted to ask was, you mentioned the undesirability of saddling the next generation with debt. The, the national debt is now in the trillions, isn't it? In, in the U.S. In the U.S.? Oh, yes. And yeah, you yeah, mentioned yeah. those military bases in you know, places we never hear about now yeah. or around the world. Could, could you make some comment, could you say something about how if there are any plans now, because this debt is increasing every day, isn't it? Well, the question is, are there any plans to do anything about the American national debt? Uh, not that I know of, not that I know of. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> because what, the, what usually happens is uh, at the state level of government or the federal government, uh, when the public does become irritated by, by the idea that there's so much debt uh, out out there, and and they are starting. College students, you read these stories of uh, a, a sociology major graduating from an undergraduate institution with two hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt, which she will never pay off. You know, no, there's no chance unless unless she marries a rich, a really rich guy, I guess. But uh, but you know, how's that going to happen? And so a lot of the, a lot of the younger people are starting to get concerned about that. So it might take another twenty years. Uh, when, with the younger generation is so concerned about this. But uh, what usually happens is uh, they get concerned and so some politician will come along and say, we need a big tax increase to, to handle this problem. So, and, and they'll get a majority of people to go along with it. So we'll have a big tax increase supposedly to reduce the debt. But then what always happens is politicians say, oh, we have more money to play with. Yeah. And we have interest group A here and interest group X over here. And they start up all these new programs so that every time we raise taxes to pay down the debt, the debt gets bigger. Because we start up all these new programs and then when the next recession hits, the tax revenues go down and the debt goes up. And so we have to borrow more money to keep the programs going because we, you know, once, the, once any government program that gives significant benefits to anybody it's almost impossible to, uh, to get rid of it <clears throat> because of the concentrated benefits, dispersed cost syndrome. Uh, you know, I, I asked my students, you know, if, if we wanted to get rid of this farm program that paid the guy in Texas $400,000, what would we have to do? Well, we'd have to organize a national political coalition that could convince a majority of both houses of Congress and the president to change the law. The law. And who's going to spend the time doing that? But the cotton farmers, they're all over it. You know, they're there in D.C. whenever the farm bill comes up for the next five-year renewal. And that, that's, that is, by the way, why they make these bills. Oh, they're always five years so that the, the members of Congress can, can collect bribes from the, uh, the special interest groups every five years. If they just pass a law and say, this is the way it's going to be forever, well, that's not good. They need a permanent engine of corruption. And so a five-year bill is the permanent engine of corruption uh, that, that they use. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I guess, I guess our time is about up then. Thank you all for coming. Okay. Um, I want to thank Professor Thomas Di Lorenzo, the first lecturer on this series. Uh, this is a token of our appreciation, a, a book about oh, yeah. Lorenzo. Oh, good. It'll, it'll motivate me to come back on a visit. Yes, uh, okay. because uh, spend some money here. I wanted help, to ask you a question, but I think it's going to be for your next lecture here. All right. Okay. About what happened in the 20th century, when there was another push of uh, 
increasing the size of the welfare well, I'm state. a very big expert on 20th century yes. uh, well, government. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Let me grab my book here and get um, out of the way. I, I, want to, I want to thank all of the um, people participating in this event. Uh, I want to ask you two things. Um, fill the exit survey, please. And please exit through that door where we have some things from our sponsors who I'd like to thank too. They make possible this event and the coming lectures. Um, of course, the um, foundation, uh, the Templeton Religion Trust and the foundations. Our patrons, um, go, help me, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, uh, Cookies Arizona, all uh, represented by Bahamas wholesale agencies. Our supporters, J.S. Johnson, and um, the, um, um, sorry, Majestic Tours, in which we have to uh, lament the death of Mr. Billy Saunders, and our donors, Bahamas First, and many other um, donors who, um, who remained uh, anonymous. Um, to the words by uh, Robin Thompson, uh, who introduced our speaker, um, I would only say, please read chapter 38 of one of the key books in the history of economics that was published in the 20th century which speaks exactly about the purpose uh, and the objects of the economic society. That's a <coughs> book by Ludwig von Mises called Human Action. And um, uh, it summarizes perfectly the, um, the need for common people, not only students, but everybody, to learn economics, because not being involved in those decisions basically leaves you at the hands of supposed experts. And, um, and it's a responsibility that cannot be evaded. And to Dean of the School of Business, Rimelda Moxie, be sure that uh, we're gonna be again here uh, in March for the second lecture, and we'll finish this uh, program and I'm already preparing for 2016. And thank you. Thanks, everybody.